Thank you to our studio audience and to those joining us around the world on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Seth Hopkins, Executive Director at the Booth Museum. We're glad to have you here tonight. Uh, outside, we have just unveiled the newest piece in the Booth Museum Sculpture Garden Collection, The Getaway by our friend Mick Dollinger and donated by our great friends Beryl and Fred Everett. How about a big round of applause for the Everett's, please? And for them coming up all the way from Florida and braving the cold weather to be with us. Extra special. A couple of quick things I wanted to tell you about coming up at the museum. On December 1st, we'll have our next Art for Lunch, and the speaker will be the author, Mark Warren. And he will be talking about the cowboy's place in America's self-image. Mmm. Things that make you go, hmm. This is all related to his newest book called Indigo Heaven. So be looking out for that. Uh, make some reservations to come join us for Art for Lunch. And if you've got kids coming to be with you, kids or grandkids, the week of Christmas, December 21st, we're having an open art studio. It's free family fun. You don't have to register in advance. Just show up, and we'll be doing an open art studio with holiday featured activities. And earlier this evening, we opened the Kids Cowboy Up exhibition. That's a show we do every year with artwork from the Hands of Christ program and also the Boys and Girls Club here in Bartow County. And uh, we had about 80 folks come to the reception for that. If you get a chance, check that out downstairs sometime over the next month or so. A lot of talented young kids in our community that have been influenced by the museum and our education staff and uh, have a wonderful show down there. So please avail yourself to it when you get the opportunity. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome from Fort Worth, Texas area, our friend Mick Dollinger and his lovely wife Katrina, who've been with us the last couple of days leading up to the unveiling. And uh, first off, I thought, Mick, we'd talk a little bit about the piece that we just unveiled called The Getaway. And this is a smaller version of it that you did first. If you could, tell folks a little bit about why you decided to do this piece, what prompted it, and uh, you know, whether you thought you've accomplished what you set out to do. Yeah, it was a, a piece I, I saw, I guess it was around 2008, 2009, I saw a, a series of photographs, um, I think it was a biologist showed them to me, of an aerial count they did of white-tailed deer in Texas and out of a helicopter, and the images looking down on these, these bucks as they're busting out of the brush, and they're terrified, obviously, but how, how they dropped and got down in the ground. And I thought, in comparison to when you see deer leap across the road in front of you, they usually have their tail up uh, like a big flag sticking up and it just impressed on, on me just the, the power it takes like a, a sprinter getting down in the blocks where they get down really low to get that power to, to get out of the ground and they were doing the same thing so I hadn't seen that done before uh, so I just I wanted to do that piece and, and that's why I did this small piece uh, in an edition of 30, I think, and sold that out. And then I ended up doing the, uh, did a commission for the large piece that you see out there now. And quite often that's how it happens. You do a small piece, somebody sees it and says, wow, that would be great, big in my yard. Will you do it for me? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And so the process of doing that, we won't go into too much detail on that, but first you start with an armature. Yeah, you can see there I'm just, just got some threaded rods they are there I just picked up at a hardware store and I'm just I bent them around and I'm just welding them together to make an armature there you can see the small marquette you can see the armature behind roughly you can see the, the just where that steer's skull is you can see the point of his his hips how it's come up higher and the antlers in the front and if you look closely you can see that it does match up one for one to the armature and that's going to be the base so then what's the next step, Mick? The next step, I, I use a foam, two-part mixture, polyurethane foam, and I mix it up in small cups, and as it foams up, I'll pour it onto sheets of plastic, small pieces of plastic, and then pick it up, stick it on the armature, and hold it there till it sets, and then just do it again and keep doing it. And then as it sets, I can rip off those pieces of plastic. And uh, once I get the whole thing built up, I'll use a sawzall and a knife and just carve it and whittle it back, as you can see me doing here. And then I rough it out. And then when I have most of the shape there, uh, I'll use a rasp and then sand it down smooth until I can get to the clay part, which you'll see the smooth part is the next, next image. Did you say a knife? A knife, yeah. Okay. Now, there's an easier way to do this, you know. There is, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, a lot of sculptors will have a 3D scan made of the maquette. They'll then pass that off to somebody who will cut the form like what Mick has out of styrofoam blocks or sheets of styrofoam and put the clay on it. Now, it's not cheating, but it's not the old-fashioned way either, right? No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a modern way, but, yeah. But you're not a modern guy, I take it. No, no, I'd still be driving a wagon if it was up to me. <laughs> Here you can see where I finished sanding the, the form, and it's just about ready to get clay on it. From this point, that foam has so much dust on it, when you, if you went to stick clay on it, it would just lift off, it wouldn't stick, so... Um, I'll go over and I'll put a, a coat of paint over it just to give it a sealer so that when I have the clay warmed up I can stick it on there and it'll hold. And there's the finished clay piece. And from there it goes to the foundry and it's the magic 31 step process of lost wax investment casting, yeah. which we don't have time to go into, but someday if you've got a cup of coffee in an hour and 15 minutes I'll be happy to explain it to you. We'll skip through that part and get to... There's the finished piece. Is this it? Fred and Beryl's place. And know. so this piece was actually purchased on a Booth member trip. I believe it was 2010. Does that sound right, Fred? And we were at Whistlepick Gallery in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas. And that was owned by G. Harvey's daughter and son-in-law. And they had treated us to uh, a very nice dinner that evening. And um, Fred and Beryl came and said, what do you think of this piece? And I said, I love it. And they said, well, we love it. And so it wound up in their backyard. And there it stayed for the next 11 years until it went flying. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this was an engineering feat in and of itself uh, to get that crane in a position uh, in a lot behind their house to get where they could lift it up. And who says deer don't fly? Yeah, really. So we wanted to see uh, how that piece actually got here to the Booth Museum and what went into it. And now we're going to launch off into a little bit of a this is your life, Mick Dollinger. <laughs> Tell us about this guy and how he influenced your life. When I was 11 years old, back in 1967, uh, a friend of my father's knew this guy called William Ricketts. He was a, a sculptor. He lived just out in the mountains outside of the city of Melbourne in southern Australia. And I got to meet him, and he had spent, as I recall, a lot of the best part of 14 years you know, on and off with Aboriginals in Central Australia. And he was just setting up this sculpture garden and all these sculptures he did were made out of uh, clay, fired clay, terracotta. And a lot of them, they were cemented onto boulders. So it's kind of like a, a rainforest type of setting with all these walking trails there. And he lived on there, had a little cottage there and he had the big kilns and he did everything on site there. And, and I was just blown away by it all. And he ended up giving me a little block of clay, and I um, you know, made an attempt at doing a little Aboriginal head um, and took it back to him, and he fired it for me. And then he gave me another little piece of, uh, of his, which I still have. I still have them both. I should have taken some photos of them, but you know, I forgot. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this is the sort of work he did. And, and it, it was the first time that um, I really got to meet a, a, a sculptor. And around that time, I also um, remember visiting the Natural History Museum in Sydney. And there's a, a number of sculptures in the front, but one that stuck in my mind was a, a, a huge piece, uh, bigger than life size, of St. George and, and the dragon. And there's a naked St. George on this big stallion that's rearing, and there's a dragon underneath the horse, and it's snarling and hissing, and St. George has this big lance he's driving down through it. A very powerful piece, and I was in awe of that. And, you know, I would go there, like, over the next years, and that even as I got older on my own, catch a train into town to see it at night with the lights on it and everything. It, was, it had a, uh, a big impact on me. But from there, I didn't ever think that, you know, anybody could make a living out of sculpting or anything like that. So it was just a, a hobby sort of thing to, to tinker with. Um, so even though your father took you out there to see that, he also thought there's no way you're going to make a living as a sculptor. Yeah. And yeah. so he sat you down and had the man-to-man -man talk, right? Yeah, exactly. He wanted me to be a plumber or electrician or a mechanic or something, but uh, which was nothing that I was interested in at all. Um, he... Um, 
at one point he, he sat me down and said I had to do a trade. At that time, I'm just guessing here, but I, I would guess that about 80% of kids like myself would leave school at 15 to do an apprenticeship, a four-year apprenticeship, uh, which involves trade school and that as well. Um, so my father wanted me to do a trade and he had a pen and paper and he was listing off different things to do and um, none of them appealed to me and until he said butcher and I thought wow that's interesting and I remember as a kid going with my mother into the butcher shops and seeing all those carcasses hang on the rail and and the ribs and the shape of the bones and it just fascinated me and because I was almost always fascinated with animals like uh, completely um, yeah, immersed in thinking about animals. It was all I thought about. And um, so then I thought, yeah, butcher. Butcher would suit me. And so he found me a job in the newspaper and I started that and I did an apprenticeship of that. And uh, I didn't think about it at the time, but it would help me later on in sculpting. But um, from there I, I sort of went to... I started doing uh, rodeos and and um, from rodeo to to doing taxidermy, I came to the I came to California in 1979. Well, here's a that's a picture of a, a Brahmin bull I'm sculpting. That's in in potter's clay. This is a, a taxidermy mannequin. So a, a Brahmin skin, the skin of a Brahmin bull would be mounted over that. Um, at the, around the same time, I was doing rodeos. Here I'm steer wrestling. I used to wear a different hat back then. You can see it up there above the horse. It's fallen off. But, um, so all, all this culminated in me you know, doing taxidermy. Um, after I came to California, uh, I met these two taxidermists and started working for them, skinning deer heads and, and birds and that because I could use a knife. Um, and I was fascinated in taxidermy you know, because I loved natural history museums. So I... When I was back in Australia, I did taxidermy part-time and then traveled around doing rodeos still and working in meatpacking plants, which was different than butcher shops. In butcher shops, uh, people get paid by the hour, sort of thing, have a regular work week. In the meatpacking plants back then, I don't know how they are now, but we got paid by the piece. Uh, it wasn't um, by the hour, so you had to be very quick at it and, you know, in some of these places, boning sheep, you know, you're boning 30 an hour, you know, 40, 50,000 a year. Um, and cattle, you might do three to 4,000 a year because they're bigger. And um, so it's a lot of bones to handle over the course of, you know, eight or 10 years, eight, eight years, I think I might have done that. And most of them look like this now, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, um, you know, the, the fascination with bones wears off pretty quick after you've done, you know, a few thousand of them. But it was just the, the money I was getting paid for it. But then later on with the taxidermy and sculpting mannequins, I'd, I'd start, um, I couldn't buy the taxidermy mannequins in Australia like taxidermists could in, in the US. There were no supply companies. So then I started at first carving my own out of foam and putting skins on and then uh, wiring skeletons, articulating them with wire and, and putting clay on, make complete sculptures that I could then make a fiberglass mold of and pour polyurethane foam into to give me the replicas. So I did quite a few of those and, and that was the, when I got some serious sculpting practice. And it's more scientific sculpting because as you do this, you test fit a skin on there, the mouth has to line up, the eyes, everything has to be, it all has to fall in place like a very fine fitting glove. Um, and it was a lot of fun, you know, but at a certain point then, you know, I, I started doing, you know, delving into bronze sculpture and my ex-wife at the time did one first and she did a few other little rodeo pieces and I would help her with the anatomy and um, I became fascinated with that and started doing that. And of course, the first few I did were very uh, literal, um, tight I would call it now, and and they were, I got to a point where I thought of them more as, as little miniature replicas, little models, rather than art. And uh, I wanted to get looser with my style. And it's, it's not as easy as one imagines, you know. I've had people at shows, at some of the hunting shows, uh, 
wonder come in and look at it and, and and they don't understand and they say why would you go to that much trouble and not finish it and and they're not realizing it it's uh it takes more effort to to create that that texture than it does to uh, finish it and make it totally smooth you know which is like more i guess to me it seemed like having a a blueprint and and you're just you know copying something but so that's uh basically how I started getting them. And you had started coming to the U.S. on a regular basis and were bringing some sculptures with you, having some success selling those at, at shows and uh, traveling, I think, with a friend of yours who had uh, jewelry. Uh, yeah, he had a, a, a business making silver jewelry and trophy buckles for cowboys. And I'd take a trailer, go on a road, do some uh, shows, uh, like some of these rodeos, a national finals rodeo, and other state fairs, and that, and sell jewelry. And I'd have some sculptures with me, and I started selling sculptures. Then I realized I had the opportunity in this country to do sculpture for a living. And then I started working out how I could um, come here and get a a work visa to live here and uh, so I did that it took took a while and in 03 I got an 01 visa and came to Texas and uh, I worked for a taxidermist outside of Fort Worth for a while and uh, until I could get get up and going with the sculpting which took me right around three years which is pretty amazing it takes some people 10 or 20 years they work in a foundry part-time they're sculpting part-time um, but you had the added incentive of there really was no one going back to Australia. You had sold pretty much everything yeah. you owned there. Yeah, I'd burnt my bridges pretty much. I had a, a taxidermy business there, and and I had a good reputation for the work I did. So I had customers. I didn't have to look for customers any anymore. You know, people knew who I were, was, and and that. And then when I gave that up, and then uh, sold my house, which happened kind of suddenly. I'd had it on the market for a couple of years and nobody even came to look at it because in a rural area. And then finally, when I was over here on a trip, I got an email from a real estate agent and told me he had a buyer and he didn't want to negotiate and he wanted to buy all the furniture that's in the house and everything that's in my workshop. And I thought, gosh, I better take it. And uh, I did. And within the next year, it almost quadrupled in price, real estate there. So I was kind of between a rock and a hard place, you know. I, I couldn't, I was barely making a living here in the taxidermy, doing wholesale taxidermy. And to go back, I couldn't even afford to buy the house that I used to have. Um, so it was a, a great incentive um, to get going and make things happen here in sculpting. So um, I would work doing sculptures in the taxidermy shop, clay, clay models of different animals. And then I finally had some people come in and saw the clay models and I got some commissions, first for a large one and a half life size leaping white tailed deer, went in front of a, in a, like a, a strip mall. And, and then some other pieces, Cape Buffalo and a pair of lions that were larger pieces, tabletop pieces. And uh, then I was away. Then I started, with the money from that, I started uh, getting more castings done, doing more sculptures and started going to shows around the country and then finally got into gal different galleries. Um, I, uh, I had a good break. I'm, I met a guy called Martin, Martin Wood, known as Bubba Wood, from a gallery called Collector's Covey in Dallas. It was uh, the leading sporting art gallery in the country. And uh, he's a person that spent his lifetime hunting and fishing and knew a lot about animals. Uh, he had a lot of collectors, a lot of customers. He'd been in business a long time. He, um, he really enjoyed um, being a critic. And so he would come out. We got to be good friends. And he enjoyed coming out to my studio and looking at my new clay models and critiquing them. And we would talk about them, argue about them, everything else. But it was a great help to me um, having a... Having a another set of eyes that gave me an, you know, an honest um, input, which over the next few years it helped a lot. Uh, so from there, I yeah, just started getting in more shows um, and other galleries. Um, Settlers West, Stu Johnson, 
in Tucson um, gallery. Um, Alan Fama in Houston is another well-known dealer. Um, Mockingbird Gallery in Bend, Oregon, and Joe Wade Fine Arts in Santa Fe, which is closed down now. But uh, that's how it all began for me, and it went on from there. And so you had a, a really exciting period from about 2006 to 2011, 12, where you're getting in those galleries, you're getting calls to be in shows, you're getting magazine articles, and so on. It really puts you on the map. So let's look at some of the work uh, that you've done since that period and uh, just kind of talk about each of these, if you would. This is a, a, it's a bust, it's a bison mask, actually. It's, it, the whole back of it is hollow inside, and um, it's life-size. It was at the, in 20, at the, the Autry, it, it won the Sculpture Award, um, which I was very thrilled with. Um, it's, it's a piece, and actually we can't see it clearly there, but um, in a static piece like that, just the head, I was trying to create movement so you can see the mane on the top of the head, the wind is blowing it, and his beard below is also being blown in the same direction. It's uh, a very loose texture. The bigger piece is obviously the texture that looks looser than it does on a small piece. Um, but it's a, a piece I'm very proud of as well. And you've mentioned texture a couple of times. One of the things you couldn't see out there in the dark with the dim light that we had is the texture that's on that getaway piece. Uh, someday if you're here, walk out there on the patio and take a close look at it and see the texture and the patina. And Mick does all his own patinas generally. And uh, look at the attention to detail and, and the textural elements of that piece, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of your work, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, this is a, a white rhino. Uh, I did a black one a few years before. and. A gentleman that bought a black rhino asked me if I would do a white rhino. So I, I, I did this as a commission, and as an, he took the number one, and it's an addition. Um, the, the rhinos, I, I find, are, are such sculptural animals. I mean, they're, I never used to think too much about them, but um, I finally got, uh, met some biologists, and I got to handle some and touch them and that, and it just fascinated me, like touching a dinosaur. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're fabulous looking. The, the white rhino, I've been told their behavior is more like horses. They're not really aggressive. The black rhinos are the ones that, like Teddy Roosevelt hunted and that they're a little bit smaller, um, a little bit more athletic and very aggressive. But uh, yeah, they're a great subject. And you've talked about one of your uh, fantasies maybe is to do one of these life size or bigger? Yeah, bigger. I'd like to do one bigger. Yeah, and something like a six, six foot by 13 foot scale, something like that. So if you know anybody that needs a monumental size rhino. Let me, let me know. This is a, a recent piece from last year, I guess. Yeah, this last year. Uh, it's called Classic with a Twist. I um, always like the look of the lion sculptures laying down like you see in front of the New York Library and in Trafalgar Square in London and that. And, um, and I thought of doing a classic pose of a lion, but I thought, how could I do a classic pose and do it a little bit different? So usually the hind quarters, they're up on the hind quarters. And this one, he's laying, the, the spine is in an S shape. So his leg is going one way and his forend going the other direction. And um, I thought it worked out pretty well. So in the human figure, they would call that contrapasta. Did they call that in animal sculpture? Not as well? that I know of, no. Okay. We don't want to get our terms mixed together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's only, well, I can't tell measurements so long, 20-something inches by you know, about that high. About the size of a bread box. Yeah, yeah, size of a bread box. And you'd like to do that one big too, wouldn't you? I would. Lions are great stuff. I guess they always have been. You know, I, I, um, I think even when the symbolism of lions, like in China, where you see them everywhere in, in front of banks. Every bank seems to have, you know, one on each side of the door, and that, you know, it's, it's a, I guess it's a symbol of wealth or prosperity or good luck. And um, so, I if guess, you know anybody who needs one of these large, yeah, I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah. And this is uh, another piece, thinking of the the animalers, and they did their panthers, creeping panthers. But I wanted a North American feel to it, so this is a cougar. And that's another piece similar to the lion, a little bit longer, smaller piece. Um, 
and it, it turned out pretty well too. It's, it's meant to be, I, I was trying to portray a, a cat like creeping along, you can see the chest is buried into the ground there, he's pushing his chest in the ground and then he's just lifting his head like he's cre creeping through grass after a quarry and then as he's got closer he's lifted his head up to make sure it's still there. And uh, this one's titled Closing In. Or it could be Look oh. Before You Leap. Yeah, yeah, it could be. That's a Either good way. one too. This, uh, a cheetah, obviously. I think most people could tell by the shape, the, the, the smallish head on them and that. Um, another artist friend, a painter, said to me, why don't you do a cheetah running but all feet off the ground? Well, that's really easy for a painter. <laughs> but it's difficult uh, as a sculptor to work out how you can support it. And it, it can be quite a problem. You know, now I've seen different, different animals done and cheetahs and that, and there's sticks. So I thought about a branch, a thin branch coming up un underneath the, the back legs and touching in a couple of different locations on the leg and the chest and then back into the ground. But everywhere I attached it, to me it looked like a, an anchor point, like it just slowed down the motion. And... The cheetah I did fairly quickly, but then it took me another couple of months to work out how I was going to support it. And then I finally came up with this arch, and I felt that it is just sliding across the arch, and there's no stopping. There's no, um, like, a speed bump at all there. It's just straight, straight over. It's slick. Um, so I think that kind of worked well. Um, yeah, I was pretty pleased with working out the arch, but... Um, yeah, that's that's about all. Yeah. The title on that one. <sighs> Gaining ground. Jumping over Thanks the oil barrel. Big one. In Texas, they call it jumping over the oil barrel. Yeah, that's it. When we do the big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of a big one. Yeah, this is uh, called Heading North. And this was also a piece where I did a smaller Marquette first. And, and one gentleman that bought the Marquette asked me if I would consider doing a life-size one. Do you uh, ever say no to that? Yeah, yeah, sometimes I do. If it's not something that, you know, if I don't share their vision, you know. Um, yeah, it's got to be something. There's too much time in there um, to to spend, you know, to waste out of my life to work on something that I don't feel like working on. But steers I like, and, and uh, so this is a piece. This is on the uh, University of Texas golf course in Austin. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, it's life-size. So your newest uh, big piece started out like this, right? Yep. Uh, this is called Higher Ground. I had a, another gentleman and his wife, they were interested in a large piece, a life-size piece for a, a new home they bought in Colorado. And um, they came to see me and I had a, I, beforehand I'd, I'd had the armature made and then I put clay on and they came and we talked about the composition and this is what we, we worked out. And uh, I'd, so I did the, finished the Marquette. Uh, this piece earlier this year won the, the Bob Coon Wildlife Award at the, the Autry Masters. And um, yeah, so from that, I would just look at that as a reference, a small one, and I start welding up a, a big uh, armature like this. This is just with rod and that. Now, I'm a really bad welder, but it doesn't matter because it's all covered, you know. This is the foam. This is with a, a spray foam, with a, a, a pressurized pack where I'd spray foam all over it, but then I'd have to add to it later as well. Um, it's the first time I've tried the the pressurized packs like that. Usually I just hand mix everything. Um, I don't know if it saved time. And here you can see it already all carved, ready for the clay. This, this piece is quite large. It's, I think it's around 10 and a half feet tall by about the same long. There it is there with clay all over it. And we were in Mick's studio a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were out there for the Cowboy Artist Show with some of our circle members. And uh, Mick and Katrina were nice enough to host us for a little brunch out there the day after. And uh, this piece was in the studio, just as you see it. 
and uh, quite amazing to see at that scale. Yeah, it's uh, the mold. Um, large pieces like this are made in sections, so it looks like a big jigsaw puzzle, all the sections all over it. And that ended up being 88 pieces in the mold. And that's, so each one is made individually, cast individually, and then everything has to be welded together. And again, it's that easy 31-step process at the foundry in between. And then it comes back, and then it's a jigsaw puzzle after that. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, are there any children in the house? Doesn't look like it, no. We didn't want to get too uh, risque yeah, here. Exactly. This one is called reclining nude. <laughs> the, the idea of this was just the classic sculptures you see of reclining nudes and they're called reclining nude one or reclining nude two and so on. I just thought looking outside my studio window at squirrels, I, I waste a lot of time staring out my window looking at deer and squirrels and such. Uh, I've always been a daydreamer, but um, I just thought about this and I thought it would be funny and it, uh, it was a good piece. It, it, wor it worked really well. This is life-size squirrel and it was uh, last year and... Um, it won an award and it, it uh, made it into the 87th annual um, exhibition of the National Sculpture Society and it won an award in there as well. So the edition sold out very quickly and then another man wanted one and I said they were sold out. He said, would you do one in a larger size? So now I've just done a, a four foot version of that which um, hasn't been cast yet. It's at the foundry at the moment. So. I'm uh, looking forward to see that in bronze. And like a lot of other things right now, foundries are way behind, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I wanted this one today, it's six months, nine months? Uh, hopefully not that long. Um, maybe, maybe three or four months. And pre-2019, you could have got them in a few weeks? Well, it, it, it depends on the foundries, how much they have. At the, at the moment, where the foundry I have doing this, um, I, I think I would get it you know, in probably in three to four months. Yeah. I'm, I've already got the whole edition ordered, is why I, I say see. that. It's not okay. like I'd have to go and put a new order. You. You know? It's an edition of 12, and I've ordered the whole lot. But if you're starting from scratch, it could be that it, six to nine month range. Yeah, yeah, at the moment, I've heard, yeah, some foundries, eight, eight nine months even. Yeah. This is a dog, uh, dog I did a few years ago. It's a German short hair pointer. We call it Kaiser. Um, there's a guy over in uh, Nevada, I think he was, and he, um, he, had, he gave me some great pictures of this dog. And one picture, this is one where we had talked earlier. Uh, I generally don't have a, have a photo of an animal and sculpt it exactly to the photo. This is an exception. He, he sent me a photo of this dog in this pose and I sculpted it in that pose. Of course, you know, there's only one photo, so you've got to work out what's happening on the other side and that. But um, it was just, a, I thought it was a very dynamic pose. These dogs are so, you know, vascular and muscly and that. I think they're great subjects. You know, the, the GSPs and the, the English pointers, I've done a few of those before too, but yeah, those type of dogs, I. I love the look of them, and I think they're great, great and, models for sculpture. And the title of this one? Kaiser. Kaiser. And it's your big? Yeah, it's only a, yeah, a small piece like that. And I'm proud to announce today that uh, Mick and Katrina have let us know there will be a cast of this in our gala auction coming up in February. So yeah. thank you so much for that. You're welcome. That was the first piece I ever saw that you had done. Oh, yeah? Oh, good. Oh, uh, yeah, they're interesting, too, for sure. Jason, if we could have the house lights up, we'll take some questions from the audience if anybody's got one. In... And, and Mick, let me repeat the question. I'm sorry, Barry. Uh, so he's asking, uh, in the beginning you were talking about you were pretty tight and just making kind of replicas in bronze of the taxidermy you were doing, and you wanted to do something more loose. How long did that take mentally and then physically to establish what you would say is your new style? How long did that take? It, um, I started in the 90s, like I think it was around 96, 97. I did a few kangaroo sculptures, and 
I thought at the time they were a loose texture, but you know, when I, I have some now and I look back, they're, they're not loose at all, but it, it was what I thought was loose. Um, so that's when I started and then I guess to the texture, as loose a texture as I am now, uh, probably about 2003 is when I, I started doing that more, yeah, 2002, 2003. But of course, it, it keeps evolving too. You know, like if you look some like some, some of my older pieces, uh, the texture looks different. A lot of people will look at a loose texture and every sculptor that does loose texture, they think of it, oh, it's a loose texture and it's all the same texture. And they're not if you study them. The, the textures are all very different. Um, and my texture has been evolving all the time, um, even within the last couple of years, they're different. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not something that I can um, just do. It's, yeah, it's an evolution, I think. I, I just, I keep playing with it and you just evolve, go along and, and it just changes over time. I know some people will, will look at something or want to, uh, they like an artist's work and they want to copy that work and, and they might buy a piece of sculpture of an artist and, and look at that texture and they're trying to imitate that texture. And I think um, that's kind of like uh, a musician doing a cover song, you know, and doing it exactly the same instead of putting their own spin on it, you know. Um, and I think, you know, most people should, you know, the, everyone's influenced by somebody, but it's, uh, it's good to just think that's the direction you want to go, but um, come up with your own your own um, spin on it. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Have you ever thought about doing any reptiles? No, I haven't. No, I haven't, really. Would you? Possibly. It depends on the reptile. Uh, it depends what it was. Yeah. I mean, anything's... Well, I, I did a hammerhead shark recently. Right. We saw yeah. that in the studio. Yeah, and I had thought about that for, for the last 15 years, on and off. Not, you know, obviously, it wasn't emblazoned on my brain. but um, And it turned out pretty neat looking. And I thought of uh, hammerhead sharks as a, as a kind of in that rhino category. They're very sculptural. They're kind of dinosaur, prehistoric looking. So. To me, that's what makes them an interesting subject, you know, compared to you know trying to sculpt a trout or something like that, you know. Um, and if anybody wants a big one of that, you're ready too, right? I am, yeah. Um, the, I will cast them in stainless steel, and it's a a spiraling fish. It's coming downwards on a base that is a continued spiral. So I think it will look. Um, I haven't cast one yet in stainless steel. I'm waiting for them. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier with your texture and uh, people who see loose textured sculpture, they just think they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So you vary that depending on the animal that you're sculpting. And I know that you oftentimes may get lumped in with a couple other guys doing that, like Ken Bunn or T.D. Kelsey or somebody. Mm -hmm. But if they looked at them side by side by side, they would see they are very different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they all vary. So from, from one piece to another on yours, they vary. And they vary among the sculptors by a wide degree. Yeah. Yeah, I think even with other sculptors, I mean, the, the texture will vary, you know. I've uh, got time for one more question. Yes. Have you experimented with the, uh, the patinas and vertex and coloring that have stayed with traditional? Have you experimented any with your colors and your patina? I am. Um, yeah, I have subtle colors in my patinas. It, it's on a. On a a textured surface, the um, those stone-like patinas uh, don't work that well. You know, they just don't turn out. I mean, you can get those more elaborate patinas that I think you're talking about um, on a very, you know, slick, polished surface. Um, I have on a lot of mine. There, there are uh, greens and browns and black, different colours, and and I I try to keep them subtle. I'm my goal is to make it look like something that is aged over time, that's been out somewhere, and it's just somebody's just picked it up in an old antique store and dusted it off, and you can see the patina has just evolved. You know, so that's that's what I'm sort of looking for. You know, not trying to get a a monotone or making a a totally green sculpture or anything like that. You know, that's why there'll be, there'll be greens coming out in certain places, but not all over. You know. 
Sure, sure. When you put that text, though, why do you think it's fantastic the way you do that? But, and when you do it, it catches the eye. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's the way they did it. And when you do it, it catches the eye. It's like he's got so much more light and shadow when you put that texture on there. And when, when you had one of those there, when you had a picture of the, the pointer that you had up there. And so when you're putting that texture on there, are you thinking about, okay, if I put this put texture on this muscle, I'm going to catch more light or I'm going to catch more shadow? Yes. So the question is, uh, with the texture that you use, it catches the light very well. Are you intentionally thinking about that as you're doing it? Is it, is it more the form, the feel, or are you really thinking about how the light's going to interact with it as well? Yeah, no, I do think about the light. Um, uh, on the high, high points especially, I mean, like if, if, you, if there's a smear, it might be you know, a smear on the high point instead of trying to have a, a, a rough texture on the top. But there, there'll still be cuts across the, the, the high points and that. But... Yeah, the, as you said, the light refraction, I mean, is, is very important and it does show a lot. There, in, in those situations, if you have the great lighting, I mean, the color doesn't matter. I mean, just, you know, the light works so well. Um, coloration matters more, I think, when in a situation where you don't have great lighting or it's very bright lighting and you don't see shadows so much or, or, or the, the light glare. Everybody, how about it for Mick? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you all coming out tonight. All right. We are adjourned. We'll see you back here soon. Take care and have a great Thanksgiving holiday.